you for being here with us this morning, and certainly all of those that have spent this week with us during our national convention. It has been a great and exciting week, and we certainly have had a wonderful time this week, and I want to thank all of you who've came all over the country to be with us. Now we want you to be, be about to get started in our program, and I would like to introduce our founder and president of the National Action Network, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Morning. Morning. Good morning and thank you. Welcome to Measure the Movement 2013. We are live on 1190 WLIB C SPAN and it will run on C SPAN again during the week three times and MSNBC. Every year at the end of our national convention, we have the leaders of various national civil rights groups join us to talk about what they have done and we have done in the preceding year, what we have not been able to do, and then what we commit to do in the coming year so that we are held accountable to what we say. It is not enough to just convene, talk about things, show how smart we are, give our best sound bites. We must measure what we do, what we do not do, so that people will know that we are serious in our service to people. This year we've added, though, that with the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, that we wanted some of those who have served above and beyond the call of duty for the last half century to assess where we are since the march, where we need to be, where we have made progress and where we have gone backward. So we have a special panel added this year that will put us in context and in focus. Let me introduce the panel to my right is the Reverend Michael Walron, who is pastor of this church, First Corinthians. He also heads the Minister's Division of National Action Network. To his right is the Honorable Rosalind Brock, who chairs the board of the NAACP. To her right, is our friend and colleague, he's been at every measure of the movement, the CEO and president of the National Urban League, Mark Moriel. <laughs> to his right is the head of Youth Move, the youth department of National Action Network, which she runs out of our Atlanta office, Mary Pat Hector. And to her right is the one and only President and CEO of the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation, Melanie Campbell. And to her right is the National Executive Director of National Action Network, Tamika Mallory. To my left on our special panel, and uh, our words could not describe this lady, and many of you saw last night on, on uh, Politics Nation, she is the widow of the co-pilot of the Civil Rights Movement, Ralph, Reverend Ralph David Abernathy, the one and only Miss Juanita Abernathy. Dr. King called him his favorite preacher. He is the pastor emeritus of the Olivet Baptist Church of Cleveland. 
and one of the preeminent ministers of our history, the Reverend Otis Moss, the junior, Otis Moss, Jr. One of the leading figures of the civil rights movement who was in the trenches for the last 50 years, unparalleled in black history, honored to have Reverend C.T. Vivian. And of course, the founding president of the Rainbow Push Coalition, who uh, headed in the 60s Operation Breadbasket, where I started under he and Reverend William Augustus Jones, Jr., and Reverend John Scott, and uh, went on to found Operation Push, ran for president, and has been a guiding force to all of us, our mentor, and on this occasion, I, w I put him on that side so he could, for, for just two hours, be the young man on the podium again. <laughs> Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. <laughs> Don't mess with me, I put you over here, you be an old man again. I put you between Rosalind and Tamika, you're age 40 years, or one move. <laughs> we'll be joined momentarily by Reverend Joseph Lowry, who also appeared last night with Ms. Abinette. Let me start by uh, saying that uh, I want Rev uh, Mark Morial and uh, Rosalind Brock and Tamika Mowry to start, uh, and then I want to put this in context because our legends that made today possible need to put in context for you watching all over the country that what we are in the midst of, if you don't have the right context, you will make the wrong analysis. We are blessed, but we also challenged. On the beginning of our convention, at our Keepers of the Dream dinner, we had a video tribute to Nan from the president, who is an African-American. We had live there the keynote speaker, the attorney general, who's an African-American. But that did not happen by itself, and it is not permanent. They did not give Mr. Obama and the first lady the deed to the White House. They gave them a four-year lease. <laughs> they will have to leave. And what will happen between now and then, and what will happen after they're gone. We need to be guided by those that help make that possible. And we need to be prepared so we use this window of time properly. But if we relax, acting like the struggle is over, we're going to end up worse than it was before we started. I would like each of you to take two minutes to tell us where you, as heads of organizations, see where we are and uh, where generally we are headed. I'm not giving the accountability of the last year yet, I will, uh, but I just want an overview from you, Mark Morial, then Rosalind Brock, then Tamika Marriott, and I want to go to our legends, and I'm coming back to Reverend Walron, Mary Pat Hector, and Melon Kemp. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, to the pastor of this church, and it's great to be in this beautiful, beautiful edifice this morning. Uh, to Reverend Al Sharpton, let's give him another big round of applause. And we're going to thank him for his friendship. And my colleagues on the panel, I'm the brother in the middle. <laughs> and uh, to the legends over on my left and your right. Uh, I want to join in just saying thank you to all of them for their sacrifices and for their very hard work to help us to where we are, which is standing on the shoulders. Stay with me for a minute. I want to give you three numbers. The, we are 50 years after the March on Washington, Birmingham, Bull Connor, the letter from the jail, the untimely death of Medgar Evers, the assassination of President Kennedy, 
the introduction of the first comprehensive civil rights bill in the Congress 1963, how far have we come? When it comes to high school attainment, we'll release these numbers next week with the state of black America. Uh, we went from 25% of African Americans having a high school diploma in 1963 to 81% in 2013. For every one African American who had a college degree in 1963, there are five who have college degrees in 2013. However, in 1963, the unemployment rate for black Americans was 10%. In 2013, it is 13%. We have to understand that we have come a great distance and we should be proud, but there is so much unfinished business. I just want to let you know quickly, over the last year, the National Urban League served over 2.5 million people in 95 communities across the country. We are the infantry men and women. We are the soldiers in the trenches trying to help people find jobs helping people train themselves for better work, running after school programs, and helping people remain in their homes by avoiding foreclosure. And we've done that work, and we do that work, and we're proud of that work. That work does not make headlines because you're saving a person one at a time. Uh, this year, we are launching a new initiative called Jobs Rebuild America. In 30 communities across the nation, we're going to expand our job training, our entrepreneurship, and our after-school programs. And for those in the audience, we're going to launch an unprecedented new effort to try to help those who've been formerly incarcerated to find training and jobs. There are, there are solutions that are out there. So I'm proud to be here today, and I thank Reverend Sharpton, and I just want to say this in in, in, in closing and yielding to Roz, uh, I want everyone to know that we have a firm commitment, a firm commitment as this generation's civil rights leaders to work together to set aside ego and rivalries. To set, to, to set aside foolishness and games and to work very hard, and we've been convening ourselves together towards a comprehensive agenda uh, for our community, uh, and, and I want to thank everyone who's been a part of that, and we'll talk about that later. So thank you, Reverend Sharpton, for having me this morning. Boss. Rosalind Brock, Chair of NAACP. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton. I, along with Mark Moriel, am privileged to be here today, and I, I thank all of you uh, for the opportunity. I bring you greetings on behalf of the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization, the NAACP. Uh, we are in the House uh, this morning, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share with you the work that we've been doing over the last 18 months. The NAACP is 104 years old, and we are in our second century. And our board, working with our president and CEO, Benjamin Todd Jealous, has worked to establish a strategic plan, five game changers, we call them, because we think these five elements, when put together, forms a mighty fist that can change the dynamics in American society. Those areas are economic empowerment, their health care, criminal justice, civic engagement, and education. We're concerned about what's happening in our community. Like Mark Moriel, it's time to put aside the, the bickering that has happened in our communities, and we need to work together in partnership because courage must not skip this generation. We are serious about the work of trying to uh, enact job creation for those, for the 14% of African Americans who are slipping in unemployment, about our young people who are not graduating from high school, who are not going to college, but also as a healthcare activist, I'm concerned about the plethora of African Americans who are dying disproportionately from HIV and AIDS. 
If our community were its own country, we would rank 16th in the world for the number of individuals who have HIV and AIDS. We've got to do something about this pandemic that's, in, that's imploding in our community. And it's time for us to do that. Gun violence is another issue that we have to do something about. But my friends, when we think about that, we are often quick to raise up in our communities when we are the victims of gun violence by those uh, police officers. But when we turn the guns on each other, we still have to have that same outrage, that same righteous indignation, because we are killing ourselves. In our second century at the NAACP, we're committed that we can't expect anybody to do anything for us that we are not prepared to do for ourselves. And that's why these types of forums are so important. And we certainly thank and praise the leadership of Dr. Reverend Al Sharpton and those who are assembled here today, who is, our, who is leading the clarion call for the African-American diaspora to come together, work together in unity. We've got to get it together if we're going to make a change in our community. And so as we think about the future, I, uh, Reverend Sharpton said, don't just talk about it, be about it. That's the theme for our young people in the NAACP. So as we get through the conversation, I brought some stuff that I want to share with you in detail. It's not about rhetoric. Dr. Lowry said in 2008, when he stood and was giving the closing benediction, when the first American of African descent became the highest elected official in the world, the leader of the free world, he said, and I quote, when will words become deeds that meet folk needs? That's why we're here. Tamika Mowry, National Action Network. Well, first of all, I want to start off by thanking all of you who've participated in NAN's 15th Annual National Convention. It has been a great showing. Our members and supporters have been in the house, and we thank you so much for being with us. And of course, And of course, I always like to give props to Reverend Al Sharpton for allowing some of us young folks to lead within the civil rights movement and to do what we're passionate about. So thank you, Reverend Al. You've heard from Mark Muriel and Rosalind Brock the many challenges that we are facing, the statistics of what is happening in our community. And we understand that communities of color and urban communities are on fire. We have been dealing specifically with voting rights over the last uh, year, um, and we've seen that our people have really answered the call to be present, to stand up, and to fight back against voter suppression. And so as we look at what is now happening in the courts with Section 5, where uh, you need preclearance in your particular districts and states in order to be able to change rules and regulations and to see that the courts are listening to whether or not Section 5 should be disbanded, we know that that is a dangerous situation for us because these laws will be changed in a way that we will be uh, misrepresented and disrepresented. And so therefore, our chapters across this country have been fighting back against that. We have been organizing people not only to register voters, but to get whatever is necessary, if it's ID that they tell you you need. While we fight that law, you have to have the ID. And so our chapters have gone out and have organized in churches and areas across this country to ensure that our people are empowered with what is necessary to fight back against suppression and against the walls of evil. And we've done that. And we saw in the 2012 election that our folks stood on lines, they would not be silenced, they got up, they did what they needed to do, and they fought back. And so while that is good, there are states that are still working on suppression. They decided that we may have uh, been able to overcome in one election, but that does not mean that they will not work on continuing to figure out how to disenfranchise our people. And so we cannot take our eyes off of the prize and go to sleep because we may feel that we won one election. 
means nothing because we will lose our rights and if they can take away our voting rights, they will start working on other rights that we currently possess. And then we see that when you hear Mark Morial talk about joblessness in our communities, very serious. It is truly causing some of the things that you see. Gun violence in communities of color is off the chain. We saw what happened in Newtown. And that obviously was you know, a tragedy that I would never, as the mother of a young boy, get a call that my child has been shot or has even seen another child be shot. Very serious, very sad. At the same time, Newtown is happening on a summer night in communities of color all over this country every day. And so how do we, while we push legislation federally, federally and locally, what do we do about reform in our community? Not just political reform, but inter-community reform. How do we get our people to stand up and address this issue of gun violence? We've been doing that. Our chapters, Maureen Forte from Chicago is here. They have been organizing people on the ground in Chicago to get our young people to cease fire in such a dangerous situation there in Chicago. In New York, we started the Occupy the Corners initiative where this summer we stood on corners all over in the worst, most dangerous places in this city, and Reverend Sharpton was out there with us at night, 11, 12, 1, and 2 o'clock in the morning. We stood on corners to mine our own streets, police our own youth, and let them know that we care about their issues. But what we know, brothers and sisters, as I close, is that this, these issues are, the issue of gun violence is not only about the gun. The gun is serious, but the issue is that communities are broken. Our young people are jobless, they are undereducated, they, are, they have mental health issues, they are serious issues that are taking place in our communities that are not being addressed. So while we deal with legislation, we also have to stay on target with dealing with job creation, with dealing with education equity, and all of these issues. And so that is what National Action Network has been doing, and we're going to continue to do that while we get the grassroots movement to continue to understand that the only way it will happen is if we work from within to change what's without. Voter rights, gun violence, employment, training, opportunities. Mrs. Abernathy, in the 50s when Rosa Parks sparked a movement in Montgomery, it was your husband that stood in a meeting in Montgomery and nominated Dr. King to lead the Montgomery Improvement Association. You shared with us last night on television how on the night, on the day that they had gone to form SCLC, that your home was bombed. You were home with one child and pregnant with another and had lived under daily threats for five consecutive years. People that are now sitting in high places people of our community do not take into account what you and others suffered that sponsored them to where they are. Share with this audience that is dealing with people that are shooting and killing each other, that are complaining about a voter ID, what you and Dr. Abernathy and Dr. King and Mrs. King and your families had to personally go through to make it possible for us to walk through these doors. Thank you, Reverend Shopton, for the opportunity. First of all, we have to understand where we've come from in order to understand where we are. There are so many of our young adults and even older people who have no idea of how we arrived where we are today. And our young people cannot be told because the parents don't know. And the parents, it's not taught in our schools. The parents are not getting it. And the church, 
Reverend, I'm sorry to have to say this. But the church, the black church, has always been the backbone of the black community. And if the black church does not speak out against the ills in our society, then where will it come from? We had the church in the movement. Had not it been for the ministers of the black church, there would not have been a civil rights movement. And I think, I think to a large extent, that's one of the basic missing elements in our society today as a race. Now, I'm not being critical of the clergy. I'm just telling it like it is. <laughs> we have a lot of theologians who are coming out of our seminaries, enjoying the fruits of our labors, and they are being told and they are saying that everything, the only thing that needs to be preached from the pulpit is the gospel. They don't need to hear anything about what's going on in our daily lives. Well, my response to that is, what God are they representing? Because, because the God I serve was concerned about the needs of all of his people. He, he fed the hungry and he gave clothes to the naked and healed the sick. So we have got to, in black America today, come out of the pulpits into the community and be concerned. And be concerned about the least of these. Because nobody in the community is freer than the black pastor. His hands are not tied, well they shouldn't be, corporate America. <laughs> and the powers, the, the city officials, because his salary comes from the parishioners of that black church. And the parishioners expect him or her to speak for them when they cannot speak for themselves. That's what the movement was about. That's why it was led by ministers, pastors. And we put our lives on the line for the least of these because many teachers and, corp and people in corporate America could not stand up. But we could afford to stand up because our bread and our, our housing came from the membership of our churches. So we were supposed to stand up and stand for those whom God had entrusted to become a member or to be a member of our churches. Now, when the ministers stand, we need to be independent. And I see so many clergy being totally controlled by positions they hold in the community. But we as church members, we need to back them up lift them up, encourage them, and let them know that you are behind them. 
and then we will have spokespersons in our communities representing God's people in the way that they should be represented. Our home was bombed and our church was bombed the same night. Fifteen minutes after our house was bombed, the church was bombed. And First Baptist Church was the oldest black Baptist church in Montgomery. Organized in 1865 during slavery. The building was built in 1890. And they loved that church as much as they loved the Lord. And my husband did not want that church bombed. But the Lord fixed it so they bombed it. And, we had, and the members had to understand that the Lord is our shepherd. Yes. And that building was just a representation. And they built it back. Yes. And we kept on moving. And the church kept to get, stayed together. Ministers all over Montgomery bonded together in support of the civil rights movement. That's how it started, and it spread all over the country. When they organized SCLC in 1957, this country became civil rights sensitive. And churches and pastors all over America became concerned about what was going on in their communities and decided that they too could do something and became sensitive for the first time, I think, since back in slavery to what was happening right under their noses because we can get so concerned with what's going on where the gospel is concerned that we don't see the shepherd, the, the sheep out in the pasture. And we don't always administer to them as we should. So I say to you as church people, push the pastor up, support him, and help him to know that you expect him to be a leader. And once the clergy in this country come together, we won't have any more problems. Because Washington knows that there is no power in the world like the church. It's an unbeatable force. And that's why we were successful during the Civil Rights Movement. We were church connected, church supported, and church led. So we need to go back to those days and pull ourselves forward. All of these clergy sitting here, I'm the only one that's, who's not a clergyman. <laughs> All of these pastors and ministers who are here have had, have laid their lives on the line. And they will continue to do it because others will see the influence that they give and that they have on the rest of us and decide that I too want to be like them. We're not where we need to be. We are still in the process. We are evolving. But we're not going to get where we need to be until we decide that we are not where we need to be. We have opened a lot of doors and we think that we have arrived, but we are not there. There's discrimination all over corporate America. There's still discrimination in our schools, as quietly as it's kept. You still go to school in your neighborhood, and your neighborhood is always on the other side of the railroad track in every community in this country. Blacks on one side of the railroad track, whites on the other. Watch it. Look at your cities and see that railroad track. They are there. That's the separation of the communities. So when we go to school in our communities, our communities are all black for the most part. So where are we going to school? 
black schools in our communities. And I'm not saying white schools are better, but we are America. We are black, white, brown, red, yellow. Why can't our schools be typical of the whole country? If we are educated together, then they can't discriminate and say, we would hire you if you qualified. Because if you educated beside that white girl or that white boy, you got the same education. So where is the difference between my qualification and their qualification? Am I making sense? Yeah. So what we need to do is reach over and understand that we need to be totally integrated in this country in order for there to be no segregation. Thank you. Mrs. Juanita Abernathy. Reverend Moss, the challenge to the black church, you've seen mega churches today, but we've not seen the connection to the movements as you've seen. Uh, we've seen this week uh, in the, our convention, some have come now, Reverend Bishop T.D. Jakes was with us, A.R. Bernard, others. What is your message to the pastors of today as one who has clearly been unparalleled in our history as a leading minister. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton, and I'm honored to be a part of this historic panel, and let me commend you for the prophetic and activist leadership that you are providing. <laughs> Reverend Sharpton, I often talk about where we are in terms of then, now, and not yet. In the world that was, I walked 12 miles per day one way to get to high school. There were prayers all along the way, but there was also clan members on the highway. Today, our children and grandchildren have a choice between the automobile their father is driving and the automobile their mother is driving to get them to school, but in between the school and the home, there is the danger of being shot. That reality is the challenge then and now. In this area where we meet this morning, the late Adam Clayton Powell talked about the necessity of preaching the gospel on Sunday and walking picket lines on Monday. That is the mission of the church. Dr. King talked about the church needing to be the headlight and not the tail light. As a matter of fact, three of the great letters that Dr. King wrote, one was a sermonic letter Paul's letter to the American Christians. And in that message, we heard it in 1956 at the National Baptist Convention before he was put out. Uh, Mrs. Abernathy was there. Dr. Abernathy was there. They put Dr. King on in the middle of the afternoon at 3 o'clock on a panel discussion, and he was listed to give the inspirational address. The planners assumed that everybody would leave, but they didn't anticipate that all of the delegates would stay and keep their seats and hold each other's seats. And when the city crowd, the Denver crowd came, there was not enough seats in the building at three o'clock. Dr. King gave this prophetic message on the challenge and responsibility of the church. That responsibility has not changed. No one bombed First Baptist Church Montgomery 
because they were simply preaching a praise gospel on Sunday morning. They were bombed because they were involved in revolutionary change in the community. And Mrs. Abernathy, that night when the dynamite exploded, found her way through the debris in the darkness to the light and did not run, did not give up, but rededicated herself. And here she is, one of those still remain and telling it like it is. It's the responsibility of the church in every generation to take the risk of being bombed for righteousness. It's the responsibility of the church to be a freedom house, a, a family house, a house of integrity. In, in, in my early days, six days a week, we were called the N-word, darky, pickaninny. But on Sunday morning, it was brother, sister, president. You see, the presidential notion started in the black church. President of the Usher Board, president of the, uh, of the board of up and coming club and the take care of me club. And that presidential theology and sociology and political science moved out in the community and caught fire with Shirley Chisholm, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and President Obama. The basis of this is found in the black church. When it is relevant, radical, revolutionary, loving, uniting, affirming, and reassuring. That is the meaning, the purpose, the call. We have to constantly take the responsibility of being put out of business in order to be worthy of being in business. The church, the church is or should be the prophetic voice the base of education, that voice uh, that Dr. King spoke. And I remember uh, Sister Juanita, Reverend Jackson, the, uh, Re uh, Dr. Vivian, of sitting with Dr. King in the education complex of the Ebenezer Baptist Church along with about four or five other young seminary students. And sitting there in calm, uh, prophetic demeanor with a loving outreach. He said to us in that intimate setting what we heard many times from the public platform. He said, we're going to win because William Cullen Bryant was right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. We're going to win because Carlisle was right. No, law, no lie can live forever. We're going to win because James Russell Lowell was right. Yeah. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above God's own. We're going to win because the Bible is right. You reap what you sow. We're going to win because the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We're going to win. Now, with all of the trouble and all of the challenges and all of the uh, unbelievable kinds of dangers and disrespect where people have not yet learned how to say President Obama, it is the responsibility of the church to teach the community that Jesus is the way, not the NRA. We have to teach the community that Jesus is the light, not the Tea Party right. Jesus is the light. And when we do this, 
untold numbers will be inspired, educated, and perhaps redeemed. And a new freedom army must be produced from generation to generation. Reverend Otis Moss, Jr. Many of us remember in history, some of you saw on Eyes and the Prize, when they fought in Alabama to give us the right to vote, one man that led people to the courthouse and was physically punched over and over by the sheriff, Jim Clark, was Reverend C.T. Vivian. From fighting for the right for us to vote to now where they have schemes to undermine our right to vote. We've gone from Jim Crow to James Crow Jr. Esquire. <laughs> Reverend Vivian, tell us how you view these 50 years and the responsibilities we have now to pick up and protect what you and Dr. King and others fought to give us. You know, I think the thing about the 50 years stays constantly in our minds and in our hearts, all right, is that uh, the problem is how to do it now, all right, is that, uh, and we've been talking about it because we understand that it's what was that inspires us, but it's what now is going to change things, and that we can't make any mistakes on that. All right, and that we have to look for the worst of the problems we have and cure them. Nobody's going to do it but us, but we're capable of doing it. And so we shouldn't want anybody else to do it. I mean, for them to do it for us uh, says we're who we used to be, not who we are now. All right, is that, uh, uh, and uh, so we're trying to put SCLC back together again. SCLC ran into some very difficult problems, and as a result of it, and money's just one of them, I mean some real difficult problems, right? And, uh, uh, and at least three of us have decided we're coming back to remake SCLC because we owe it to Martin King, right? You see, we owe it to Martin King, all right? Uh, uh, is that uh, one of the past presidents is coming back, uh, 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 and uh, one of uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bernard Lafayette, uh, and that's terribly important for this reason. In fact, Lafayette is is taking nonviolence all over the nation. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Uh, 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 is that uh, um, he's taking it all over the world? We brought 19 people in from uh, uh, Nigeria. Uh, and uh, kept them for two weeks. Uh, they've gone back to do some good work already. Now, but the point being is, uh, we're right when we say uh, that uh, uh, we will win. But we didn't win before simply because we went to church or because we marched. We went because we had a solving of the problem. Uh, we all would have moved. We were all upset. We all wanted a better way to live. Huh? Uh, before Martin ever moved to Montgomery, we wanted something better, but we were getting exactly what the sister was talking about. All right? Now, the thing is, when we look at it, we've almost forgotten why we made it over. Uh, is that uh, we were being killed every day in, in, uh, in the South, all over the South, in fact, all right? Uh, nothing changed. The laws were passed, but nothing changed in the South, all right? Is that uh, uh, our schools didn't change like they did in Kansas. Nothing changed because we didn't have the right strategy. What Martin King brought 
was not just a matter of a new voice, but a new strategy, a new way to move. It was nonviolent direct action that made it possible for us to win. We didn't win simply because we stood up. We stood up because we had a strategy upon which we could stand up without being killed. All right? And, and we've almost uh, uh, forgotten that that strategy was there and that it ever existed. But without it, we will not make it. We are to change the world we live in. That's what that strategy means. It means that we're not just to change black people or the black condition. We can all stand up in the street and do and make our voices heard if we choose to do so. It was interesting that every movement followed the African-American movement, but the African... And, 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 we, and we have to see that the African-American movement was based on nonviolent direct action. Mm -hmm. All of the people who wanted to act didn't act because they were afraid to act, mm -hmm. right? But when Martin gave us all, all, black, white, yellow, pink, polka dot, that doesn't even matter. It gave helpless people, gave helpless people a way to move, then we all move. We were all suffering and we all still will be uh, uh, suffering until we believe that we really have a method that will allow us to win. Nobody wants to act, they want to win, right? We want to change the condition under which we live. That's the important thing. You know, I was just thinking about uh, 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 problems that we have like education. You know, uh, uh, a child is dropping out of school every 27 seconds. I, I didn't say minutes, I said seconds. I, and why should they be dropping out one every 27 days, much less uh, uh, seconds? Is that uh, when we look at it, is that 50 per we, we, we love to see pictures in the magazines of, uh, of uh, young people with uh, uh, the graduation hats on and uh, uh, both in high school and college. And it makes us feel good when we, when we look at it. The pictures are so pretty and there's so many of them, you see. But you see what is really happening, 40% of us are dropping out of school. And within a year and a half, they're in prison. And we are not talking about that, or are we finding a way to change it? But it becomes very clear, we can't be a people, huh? Uh, if we are dropping out when other people are getting major educations in the sciences. Uh, when we look at China with 40 million people coming out of, uh, with, with uh, degrees in science, and, we're, and the United States is now 18th uh, in the world, and we are at the bottom of that, right? Is that uh, uh, the responsibility that we have is quite great, but quite important. And just as we walk down the streets then, we've got to do the same kind of thing huh? right now. In fact, if we take the million people in, in, in prisons alone, Right? We're, we're not quite certain of that number, but everybody uses it, right? So we don't know whether it's small or large, but we know that too many of us are in prisons today, right? Prisons, right? And they are dying in prison, and they're not out here helping anybody exist, all right? Nor are we creating a means for them to really live, all right? And then we say, but why are they selling dope? Because they don't have a way to live, all right? And if we don't change it, and how do you change it becomes the issue. It's in the action we find out who we are. And it's in the action we're gonna find out who we will we'll, we'll be. You can't do it talking. You know, I, I was so happy uh, uh, when, when, when I, I saw Al uh, uh, 
on TV. And what I said was, is that that's what we used to do on Monday night during the movement, right? Is that we had a, 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 a church uh, 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 on Sunday, then we had mass meeting on Monday. And that's where we got together as a community. That's when we were thinking together so that we could act together, right? That's when we heard the voices of those that would make a difference. That's where we learned what we liked and what we didn't like and what we would do. And we would live and die on the basis of what we do. We'll not live and die on the basis of what we say. All right? And, and, and the thing is, is what, and when, uh, uh, and when we uh, 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 hear, uh, see, you know, we can hear him every night now, you know, man. almost, you see, almost every night. Uh, uh, we, we have to be on the road sometimes so we don't get to hear him all the time. But the point is, he's taking that message and he has an immediate contact with the President of the United States as well, right? Now, I'm not just saying that because we're at his meeting. I say it all the time. Uh, in fact, I told him a long time ago before there was a meeting, right, that I'm glad that we have something, somebody to take the place of the Monday night mass meeting. See, it, 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 it's when we come together, hear the words, uh, all right, that, that we know are backed up by the word, right? Mm -hmm. It is then we have a chance to win. Is that when we, when we look at those education figures, we can't make it without it. And when we look at the fact of what Martin King did, we can't win simply because we use his name. We got to use it because we use his methods, because we have his strength, because we take that chance, all right? We're willing to die for something. If you're not willing to die for something, you're not fit to live for something. That's what Martin said, right? And that's what it's really all about. We are a people that have had to die for nothing. So now that we've made it, let us die for something. All right? We, uh, we have lived without lots of money. All right? All right? And, but, but we will never make it if we don't use the money we now have uh, properly, right? Is that uh, how do we organize? How do we put our well, uh, 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 what we have behind real meaningful programs? That's what changes things, right? How will we really work with each other to make, to make things happen? We committed ourselves at SCLC uh, uh, we're remaking it because of Martin, right? Uh, uh, but the thing is, we committed ourselves to what? To understanding that the best thing we have done as black people is to put 40-some uh, people in Congress. And, and see what I'm saying? Is that we, we got political power. And we can, and we say, but what are they doing? Well, they're doing a lot more than it seems, but they'll do a lot more when you seem like you are behind them and want them to do something, right? And we have to see it in terms of our ability. At, at, uh, so what we're saying is, everybody should be involved in making everybody else register to vote, right? That's the thing that we've done so well, right? We didn't win simply because it was nice, all right? We won because it was necessary, all right? And, and, and we have to make ourselves know that we can't afford to lose anything we've won. We work too hard to lose it, right? All right? And we have a time as a people to redo what we've already done when we know how to do it, right? We've got to go beyond it to something higher and better that is so definite so that we really free our young people. And you know what? 
uh, 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 I, I was just talking somewhere some, uh, uh, sometime, and it hit me, who's gonna be, who's gonna be our grandma? That's who kept our families together. That's who kept us religious. That's who kept us believing in God, all right? That's who kept us going to church, even when there wasn't anything there to hear. <laughs> they figured it was better for you to be there than not to be there, right? Point being is that we must go to those churches where we have a chance to move and act. And those that don't want to act after church, forget them, all right? You don't need them, all right? Is that we've got to understand the reason for going to church is to organize to save ourselves, all right? Uh, uh, let us be about the central business. All right. Reverend C.T. Vivian.